Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. Today we have part three of my conversation with Aaron and Rachel Alder. For those who have been listening and who have gotten very involved in their story and really care, I'm sure that you'll be happy to know there is a third episode, but sad to know that it's the last one. And they are, of course, invited back to share more of their story if there's more that they want to share. I want to say, too, before I introduce them, that this series of episodes has touched a lot of people. Not only have I been contacted by other people who have been in this very same offshoot that Rachel and Aaron were involved in, but also people who have been harmed by 12-step experiences and by AA, some of whom who really have moved away from 12-step and AA, others who are still involved but realized that there are inherent dangers or the potential for danger without enough safeguards, which is something that Rachel and Aaron and I are going to talk about towards the end of this episode. I truly want people to be able to have an experience that is more connected to updated senses of scientific discovery about addiction and also that not everyone needs to call themselves an addict in order to be able to get help. And not everyone needs to believe in God in order to get help. It needs to be done in a more tailor-made way, like it's done with groups like Smart Recovery and others like it. But really, unfortunately, when this system was put in place, there were not safeguards put in place. So this is not at all meant to have you move away from your 12-step group or your AA group if that is what's helping you and nothing bad has been happening and you're not in danger and you're surrounded with people who really do care and also are sensitive to and respectful of your boundaries. But I do think it is problematic when, for some people, They really do need to stay connected to something lifelong, while others don't. But they're made to feel scared of leaving. And then they don't get a chance to find out if they could do this on their own, if they could remain sober, if they can remain happy, if they can remain on track without daily or weekly meetings. It's something so important to be able to find out that a lot of people are robbed from being able to find out in these organizations. Again, a change that I think needs to be made. So for today, for the third episode, I want to be able to read Rachel's words as she sent me an introduction for both her and for Aaron. From 2012 to 2019, shortly after Aaron and I met, we found ourselves in a situation within AA where our vulnerabilities were being used to control our behavior. I didn't think that could be something that would happen to me. I am educated, including a degree in psychology. I have a strong family support system. I've lived all over the country and experienced many different situations and people. It didn't occur to me that this could or would be something I could fall victim to, but nevertheless, I did. Aaron did, and we stayed in it for seven very long years. So we are recording these episodes to ensure that others who come across this podcast know that this can and does happen to anyone, and there should not be shame around it and that there is another way to live that doesn't involve being controlled by one or two human beings or even an organization. Personally, my biggest vulnerability that was exploited was undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. This disorder created near constant thoughts inside me that I would cause harm to the people I loved and cared about the most. It tortured me for 12 of 13 years of my sobriety. 
And Aaron's biggest vulnerability became whether leaving this group or leaving these people meant leaving our marriage. When we left the group and the sponsor you will hear about on this podcast, and eventually for us, AA, our marriage began to truly take shape. I also was finally able to get the treatment I needed. This help has literally changed my entire life. For people who have been in AA a long time and or are still attending, this isn't meant to be an attack on AA. It is our personal experience and the experience of many others. If AA is working well for you, wonderful. And if not, then there are other ways to move forward in life. AA says this as well. Thanks for listening to our story. And here is part three, the final episode, with Rachel and Aaron Alder. I am honored to have Rachel and Aaron back on the show for part three of a three-episode show. It was really important to be able to finish things up kind of tie up loose ends and continue on with the story because where it left off was kind of in the middle or only three quarters of the way through. So it seemed important to finish things, knowing also that with the time limitations of, you know, podcasts, there's a lot that needs to be left out. So, you know, I want people as they're listening to the story to know that there was so much more, but that these are the things that really highlight why they wanted to be able to break free from that system and also why they want to talk about it. So where would you like to to pick this up? Where we left off last time was in talking about Rachel's experience and how she was confronted by a member about the things that she had done wrong surrounding the death of the death of our daughter and that it it took Rachel a day, a couple days before she would even talk to me about that experience and share with me what had happened. And I'll never forget, it was just such a pivotal moment for me. Um, I could tell something was going on. I could tell something happened. Rachel just wasn't herself. And we were walking through a mall and it just got to a place. And I, I don't recall if Rachel said, I need to tell you something. I think that's how it went. We sat down on a bench because I could tell something big had happened. And she broke down into tears and shared with me that this experience had happened with this person. And I just remember being so mortified that this was happening, that that somebody could have it in them to take my wife aside, have a written list of all of the things that she had done wrong surrounding the death of our daughter. I, just, I, I could not comprehend that that was even possible. And let alone the, the pain that it was causing Rachel. I mean, it was just almost unbearable for me to now being experiencing that with my wife and not knowing what to do. What do you what do you do when you're still in a place of not being able to talk to people and, you know, talk about these experiences? And it was just a very big turning point for me of this is all not okay. So what did it take for you to just have that very clear realization and work through the fears that you have been given about having those emotions to really be clear about it? It became more clear for me, but I was still very much in a place of I, it was always like a choosing between my wife and this program. And of course I was very protective of her, but at the same time, she was still so in it and she was still so tormented by all of it. And I mean, Rachel, I'll let you continue from, from then on because we stayed. And even after an experience like that, the hold that it has on you and, and the things that occurred after that experience. I didn't get much recourse. I didn't get to, you know, I was angry. I was, I mean, flat out, I was very, very angry at this person. I felt very violated by the fact that my wife was just, was attacked for all intents and purposes. Again, surrounding the 
the death of our daughter. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we stayed in two years after um, this incident happened, not um, by Aaron's choosing, although we never talked about it directly. I always could feel that she wanted to move on. And I was so terrified that if I did that, everything would fall apart, that I, that I, I couldn't do it. I just, I, I literally thought that I would lose everything, uh, lose my family, um, and, and that everything would come crumbling down. So although I did know that what that person had done um, was wrong, and it, you know, a few nights after that happened, I remember just getting up in the middle of the night, laying on the side of the bed, sitting on the side of the bed, just sobbing, because I couldn't, my brain it literally, I tell people this when I try to explain what it's like to be in one of these manipulative situations, but it felt like my brain was splitting in two, that there was one slice that was who I actually am. And then all of this dogma, that was this other slice. And I just laid on the side of the bed with my, my hands over my ears and just rocked because I couldn't, I couldn't, Soothe. I'd never done anything like that. I couldn't soothe myself. Um, and uh, I just couldn't understand. But fast forward from there, right? Because I continued to essentially hear the message of, I was directly told by my sponsor that if, if I didn't make amends to this person who came to me and shared all of the things they felt I had done wrong in the death of my daughter, if I didn't make amends to them, that I would never get well. And then I made amends to them. I don't even know what for at this point, like for not being able to hear them or see them or understand, you know, it's just all a bunch of garbage. Um, and and so that's the the biggest, I think that's the one thing that might lurk for me in this is that if I had the opportunity, I would never, I probably wouldn't reach out to that person, but if I saw them in public, I would, I would take that all back. It's just so intense and so wrong. And yes, tremendously confusing and playing on your conscience that you need to apologize and make things right. And, you know, where's the compassion to you, to both of you? Where's the, you know, they've just been through a trauma. Let's back off and let them heal. Wow. Dial it up. Dial it up. Dial it up. I'm the di dial it up. Maybe a couple steps back, but ultimately we're we're dialing it up. You need to be doing more. Yeah, dial it up when there's that those moments of ultimate vulnerability, and mm -hmm. you know when people are at their lowest, I you could call it, or just you know in those moments, that was when it seemed it got turned up. So I'm wondering, you know, I know that you know about your the group that you were in, and do you know if that's something that happens in other groups like it, or is it just this kind of anomalous, sort of depends who's running it, and if they have that kind of ego need to have everything be about them and everything being be about their their leadership and really that they don't care about you. Is this common practice or is this uncommon? I would say it's uncommon. I mean, AA is very much, in a lot of ways, a very hands-off organization, almost to their detriment, in my opinion. But I think any other alcohol, almost any other Alcoholics Anonymous room we had walked into would have shown us nothing but compassion, hugs, understood if we slept in one morning, it would have been a very different picture. Well, it's the same, I think about the idea of, you know, we... I mean, all, there's so many different sayings, you know, we don't shoot our wounded and, you yeah. know, we welcome people back. People have relapses, whatever. And it was always, you're always welcome back. You're always welcome back, you know, to have a relapse. But like, I think about our situation and how the things that happened around that, and it just doesn't, to me, it's a human element. It's being human. It's human decency, which was just completely lacking in that situation and the sense of almost ownership over our lives, mm -hmm. you know, the ownership of how we should have handled that situation, all the different things that we went wrong, that we did wrong, you know, pointing out things like 
well, you didn't invite us to the hospital to meet your daughter who was only alive for 36 hours. Like, how is that even a human response that a human that has a heart and a mind and, you know, it just is, it's mind blowing. And, and I mean, it's unconscionable. And I'm sure a lot of people would just be shocked to know that you were given a hard time. It says a lot about the nature of the people who were in charge. And, you know, there are people who are just so self-focused, so kind of narcissistic in their way that everything is about them, even when it really should not be and even when it really isn't. But you have to, you have to turn your focus back on them and some of that is this subconscious thing that goes along with a personality disorder where they feel threatened by anything else that distracts you or anyone else who can take your attention away. And so it's so much about that, not about your experience, not about how to, like, how to be a human being here, but you're stealing something from me. I have to grab it back. And is that something that you felt happening in this group? Yeah, the attention, the focus couldn't, it was, but it was almost like a game because if the focus was there, it was, you, you just, you just never know. And I don't know if we said this before, but it's like that also, you never knew where the mark was. Right. You were, yep. you weren't sure like, okay, you're supposed to be the leader. You're supposed to be the person but yet in only in, in places where you decide that that fits. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a play on, you know, back to like the vulnerabilities and where if you do something wrong, it's that guilt and shame about what you did to that person, that leader of now, how do I get back in their good graces? And it was this constant battle of shaming shaming, shaming, shaming. And I'm so focused or so focused on getting back in the good graces of this person. I'm completely missing the life that's going on around me because they are the number one thing. They're con basically controlling my thoughts and my feelings and my life. All right. So then continuing on for the next two years, then you were done. So at that point, what happened and how did you go about leaving? So two pivotal things our son was born the end of june 2019 and my sister who was also in this group but really the sponsorship line because she lived in another state mm -hmm. so she wasn't in the group itself she didn't attend the group but she was she was sponsored by tracy um she got married in september of 2019 so when our son was born of course I don't need to tell anyone who has kids that that changes literally everything in a wonderful, beautiful way, except again, everything was ratcheted up, especially for, for me more so than Erin. At that point, Erin had, she still attended the group, but she had created a distance between her and our sponsor and a lot of, and some of the other people in the line. So she hadn't formally left, but our son was born and the demands kind of increased in a lot of different ways and then uh, my sister got married so that meant that we went back me and Aaron and our son to uh, we were there for nine days and so that means that we were out of that group for nine days which allowed other ideas to come in which allowed our brain to breathe and I went hiking with my sister one day and uh, just, again, like ended up in tears and um, holding, you know, our little two month old, three month old, whatever he was at that point, baby. And I just remember telling her, I don't know who I am anymore. Like, I, I just, I don't know. And then because of how Aaron and I's relationship had worked, it was really a dance initially between us of how do we start talking about this? And so it cracked a little when we were in Nashville together for, for my sister's wedding. And a couple, we had a couple little hints of a conversation. And then when we got back, going to bed at night, we had a couple more hints of a conversation. And I don't know, it just snowballed um, after that. There was one specific, I think I mentioned this in 
the one of the episodes, but there was a good friend of ours that was in the sponsorship line and we just adored him. And he had been with us for a year and attended every day for a year. And then all of a sudden he was gone. He left. And I, something about him leaving, like it just, it, it finally broke it all free for for me. And I was the one who needed to be able to leave. I had told Aaron one or two nights before that, I said, if, if you want to leave, you can leave. And I left it purposefully open because to me, it meant the sponsorship line, the meeting, the marriage. I knew that I knew what I was doing to her. And, and, but then we were able to, this one crack was made and it was a, a good chunk. I called my sister at three the next morning, told her about the crack that had been made and, and then everything just started to crumble. So, yeah. And I think the, you know, to add a little color to some of those things was, you know, our son was born and there we were with a brand new baby living, you know, 30, 35, 40 minute drive from this 6 a.m. meeting every day. And we were expected the day that we came home with our newborn baby, we better be there at 6 a.m. So here we are, two moms, you know, with a brand new baby, setting our alarm at 345 so we could somehow make it out of the house, you know, to get to a 6 a.m. meeting bringing an infant, a brand new infant into a room of who knows who could be in these rooms at any point um, and staying there and being in this room with this baby. And obviously you don't want to disturb and just the mental torture of that, that, that we did that every day. My family couldn't understand it. They were constantly questioning yeah, that my mom too, like, how can you do this? Like, this is insane. And we just did it. We just, we didn't have a choice. Rachel felt like she didn't have a choice. I every day probably said it was the most asinine thing that I can imagine that we're doing every day. I was sponsoring someone at the time. And so that was very much used as a threat that I had to be an example and I had to show up every day to show people that you could have a baby and like not miss a beat. And she was breastfeeding as well. And we, of course, both had to be in the meeting. She had to be in the meeting. If she left for too long with the baby, there was words about it. It wasn't a good thing. It got to the point to where I would be the one that had to have wear him because we would wear him during the meeting. And if I had to go out with him, like there was mornings where I was standing outside with him for 45 minutes of the meeting because he was crying or he, you know, and under a tarp, under like a in tarp, the rain. like in, and she couldn't leave. And again, the, the torment of doing that day after day after day and to still like see the torture that it caused her of like, I can't leave. I have to do this. I can't do this. And I just, we just did it. Yeah, there's just one quick thing I'll share about that is um, that I feel like is a really good example of the subtle ways of control is I was supposed to meet with Tracy in her car <laughs> after uh, one of the after after our son was born. And uh, I had to leave during a significant portion of the meeting because he was crying and I needed him not to be distracting and I needed to be his mother. And um, and so uh, when I came back in about five minutes till everybody was holding hands and saying the serenity prayer and um, I held hands with Tracy and I said so we're about to go meet and she said I'll talk to you when you have a full meeting and then that walked away and I just remember being destroyed by that like and those are the things that it's hard I loved what you said and the first episode of how hard it is to describe what we've experienced because it's all of these subtleties that just tear you down and make you think that you are the worst. Right. So I was wondering what went through your mind when you were told that you needed to have a full meeting. I mean, uh, my physical body was immediately affected in terms of it just like I knew that it was wrong. I think ultimately where it came around is that 
remember sending Tracy this long email of all the things that I could do uh, to ensure that I could be there for the one hour in the morning. At one point, I had gathered a list of um, all my friends, called each of them and said, I need to drop my four month old son off at your house at 530 in the morning so that I can go to this meeting and not be disturbed. And then I'll come pick him up. And I had seven days a week schedule covered. And it took about, it basically took Aaron like hitting me over the head with a hammer to say, I'm not, we are not doing this. Yep. And so that's what I did. You know, I just dug in deeper because I just thought I truly believe that my life depended on it, that my family would not be safe from me if I didn't do these things. Because that's what she told you. And my OCD. I really feel like that is a huge, for me, that's a huge piece of this story. It is a huge piece. And I think, right, I was curious about the the linchpin, so to speak. So, right, so that you would bring harm to yourself, your family, all your loved ones, and you couldn't take that risk. And then, right, with your OCD playing a part, um, there are people who come into these situations having different psychological needs and wirings and histories. And when you have the whole, you know, mm, if all you have is a hammer, everything needs to be a nail or everything looks like a nail, then you don't treat everyone individually. And if someone really knew you and got to know you and saw how seriously you took things, and how ordered you were in your thinking and making sure that you didn't skip a beat and wouldn't let anyone down and that you were holding yourself up to a superhuman standard. Someone who cared about you would say, you know, you're okay. You know, you're kind of, you're doing 150% and you can actually kind of tone it down. You'll still be fine. Because that becomes the weakness that they can capitalize on, which is very cruel. So, right. So what did you do about it? Faced with that situation, you made accommodations, you made it work, you made it happen. And then at some point you had that time away, which is really good to have that vantage point and to wonder if all of this is worth it and also be able to see what you're getting from it because it seemed like what you were getting from it was getting detached from yourself. But, you know, that's not putting you in a safer situation at all because then you don't act on your behalf and you don't protect yourself when you need to. And because you don't have your feelings. Okay. Okay. So I'm just thinking of the whole opposite day thing that happens in a lot of groups where, you know, there's all this control. So here to, to keep you safe, you're actually being put in harm's way. It's just, you know, yeah. So that's part of the mind bending. I don't know how to explain this to people because it doesn't make sense. So, right. Very pivotal moments. And then was there anything else before you didn't go back? Uh, I think it was, um, so that talk with my sister and when I was there for her wedding, I started looking up stuff about brainwashing mm -hmm. and then look, we, we found you, we, I started to Google things about cults and, uh, we found an interview that you did on a radio show with a gentleman that had been sci in Scientology, I think for a number of years and um i listened to it and i was like holy crap like that is exactly what we have been a part of like there wasn't anything that you said that wasn't my experience and so i sent it to aaron i sent it to my sister i sent it to aaron's best friend that we wrangled into this thing too and then that's and then when we talked to you finally um and you said you have a constitutional right to be free. It was like, we said the that. The light bulb went on for her. <laughs> so, like, and for me, it was just like, thank God. Thank God that something got through, something opened that door because that's what it was, like that essence of freedom. And I think the, the tie on to that, uh, the time that we spent in Nashville and one of the times I remember is Rachel and through talking about this, but we sat, the three of us were together at one point and it was the first time for me and for us together in seven years 
that we started to even talk about some of the things that had happened, some of the experiences that we had had in this. In seven years, it was the first time. And it was so eye-opening and almost freeing as Mm -hmm. well. There was that freedom of like, I can say these things out loud. And it was, it was huge. Mm-hmm. Right. And you're, you're like dodging lightning bolts and oh, look, nothing, nothing's happening. How nice. But you don't find that out until you take the risk. And that's a really hard gap to kind of go through, like just to, mm, are we going to fall into this abyss or are we going to make it over to the other side safely? And right. For people to just take that chance. I mean, I've had people in my office who are in like Bible-based cultic groups who will start to tell me some of the things they were told to keep secret and they duck, right? I understood why they were, why they were ducking <laughs> and just see that thing happens. And the only thing that does happen is that you get a benefit from exercising your right and sharing how you feel and connecting and having the other person say, I get it, or me too, the whole me too movement right? It starts with one person talking to someone else so that the other person can say me too. And so I think I want to also, you know, make sure that we mention for you, Erin, you know, that you were ready to, you were ready to go and sooner. And I know that that's a hard thing within a couple where, you know, you do a lot for love and you will show your devotion and you'll make your sacrifice. And the other person then can feel guilty about, you know, schlepping the person they love along for longer than they would have wanted. But it says something about what you're kind of willing to go through together, not let the other person just out in the cold and really help them along that journey and not make them feel alone, which I think is a very powerful message that, you know, that you're able to send. So you left. Oh, no, and I want to mention also about this man who left. And I don't know if you've had a chance to speak with him about why he left, but I just want to say that sometimes that does make a huge impact when suddenly someone's gone and someone who you liked and respected. And then you wonder what happened? Something must have happened. Or were they just kicked out and treated horribly and unfairly? And you know, that's not good too. Either way, it usually makes a very big impact, just the missing people. Okay. So then, so you left, did you announce it? Did you, what was the process? So we'd seen a lot of people move (laughs) and leave over the years. So there were some things we were, and we had tried to leave, right? Two other times before we were successful this third time. So we had some ideas around how not to leave. (laughs) So we applied what we had learned from previous. Aaron just kind of slowly rolled out and I was trying to finish a responsibility that I had with the group. And so I ended up meeting with Tracy and another person at a higher level in the sponsorship line, let's say, uh, to finish this project. It was writing the story of our group, actually. And we were doing this last revision and I Uh, met with both of them and it turned into them turning on me and saying, essentially knowing that I was on my way out and confronting me with that, which I knew would happen. Uh, And I held my ground as well as I could given my state of mind. Um, And then it was only a, a few more handful of meetings after that. And I think after, again, talking with with you and hearing some really concrete, factual information about how people, you know, what are red flags of, of these types of groups and just really being able to a- identify with that. I remember going to the meeting uh, my last time and saying something about everybody being free and creative to do whatever they want. And it was like the last, I was the last person to talk that day. And, uh, and we just never went back and we didn't hear from anybody and we knew we wouldn't because that's what they teach you. Well, and even at that point in talking about Rachel, going back to meet with those people, that commitment of hers, of I started this project. (laughs) And this was after we had even had those conversations of like, We don't owe anybody anything. Like we can just leave this insanity now. And she was still drawn. She still felt that sense of commitment to finish out 
that project because it was so drilled into us that, you know, you'd be a quitter. You're a quitter if you don't finish out these things. And I mean, you could, I could just see it still resonating in Rachel that she, and I think I even told you, I'm like, you don't have to go back. You don't have to do any of this. We can, I, I specifically remember saying, we can just not go. And it was still hard for her, that pull. And she ended up going and, you know, having that. And I think the reality for us was the, the, we know when you do the, you just don't go it still baffles my mind. You know, we were with these people every day for seven years, spent so much time with them, went through so many different things. And when we decided to just not show up, you know, and it was a conscious decision, we're done. You're supposed to see them at 6 a.m. the next morning. And we didn't show up, which you know is abnormal. And nobody called, nobody emailed, nobody texted. Not one person from that group reached out. And still to this day, I, or, or, the I mean, core people, the yeah, core not, people, not a word. And yeah. that was how it went. When people left, nobody called to ask questions. Nobody, why are you leaving? What is the situation? It was, and it almost is a, a clean break. Mm -hmm. As long as you can live with yourself afterwards, <laughs> which takes a lot, of, but it, you have to make that clean break because any little bit that you hold on, the, the, the hook gets, the hook gets, gets put in there. And I just, I think about that all the time is that sense of freedom of we're done. We do. And, and for me to really see that in Rachel, that like we did it and she did it. And the fact that she was willing to make that clean break was huge. It was a huge turning point in so many different ways. Huge. And I also think about that clean break. It is it's a blessing in disguise so that you don't have to deal with getting constantly harassed and called and people showing up at your door and what a lot of people have to deal with when they leave groups. And at the same time, for some people, it's the impetus for them to want to go back because the silence is deafening and they don't have anyone else. And they lost their whole community and they didn't have a wife and they didn't have a child. And you know, and so I think for some people, it makes them kind of go back like a puppy, like, what can I do to get back into your good grace? So I have something, but thank goodness that the two of you had each other and had your families and had your adorable little one. And, and I think that it really helps a lot to detach from the dependency and realize that you don't need it. And you also don't need it to be safe. And you're probably safer without it. That takes some doing. I'm just wondering, even just physiologically, you were so used to a schedule and you're so used to having to be on time and having that pressure and what it was it like for you the next day to not have to be somewhere in the morning? For me, it was like, I just was so, th I was like, thank God we made it out. I really didn't know if it was ever going to happen. And I think I had gotten to a place of, even though I believed, I just, believed and believed that something was going to crack for her. I hoped and hoped. I didn't want to leave our marriage. I loved her. I love our relationship. This thing that had a hold on us, I had to believe that something was going to break it. I'm sorry, but you, it just is insane. So to just be free of it. And I think for me, I am more of a person that done, done, walk away. Like, and so, but to know that I really needed to be supportive of Rachel through that process and that, and cognizant of it wasn't going to be as easy for her as it was for me. And that now it was important for me to be supportive of her through whatever this was going to be. And the fact that we had stepped away and that we woke up that next morning. And I mean, it's just, it was, it's, it, there's no words. So good. I think it's a hard thing when so much of what you've been taught is laced with fear. To go through a transitional time, you can feel very shaky. And unless like you, Erin, I think you were done. You had been done for a while. And so it makes it a little easier finally when the decision is made. But for you, Rachel, I'm just thinking of what was going on for you. Yeah, it was really a tough transition. 
for me um, on a lot of levels. Number one, I had been part of AA for 13 years at that point and going every day and had long before Tracy had the message given to me in the rooms and by previous sponsors that, you know, if, if you start to pull away from AA, that your life is going to start to go downhill, you're going to drink again, or things, you know, are going to start to crumble. And so I had seen before when I had gone like a week, that was probably the most I ever went without going to a meeting was a week. And where I could be more like irritable or agitated. Uh, and so that's that started happening for me right away, which is what I was scared about happening. And I don't know how much of that is because I knew that is what was going to happen. So then it happened or if it was whatever else. And, and tied in with that, ultimately anxiety, you know, that I was experiencing. I knew that that anxiety would lead to an increase in those terrible thoughts that tortured me because I'd seen it happen time and time again. And so that was always my biggest fear, even as we were talking about leaving and preparing to leave. In my mind, it was always like, know that these thoughts are going to get worse. Like they're going to get worse and I'm not going to know what to do with them. But I knew that I had to. I mean, Aaron made it very clear to me that we could not go back. Like we could not go back. And I believed her. And I knew that I just needed to do it. It was just so scary. And so initially I thought I would keep doing all the things, all the what, all those nevers we told you, all the, the rigidity, still going to a 6 a.m. online meeting, still do all the rigid, but just without the sponsorship line. And quickly, Aaron and my sister were like, no, <laughs> I don't know how else they said it. It was just, it wasn't going to happen. And so things just started to dial back slowly. And, you know, I, I've started to, to work with you, Rachel, and, and uh, we got to talk about some of those things and some of the other things that had occurred in my life that I was able to start addressing. I don't know. It just started to unwind. And then, you know, I quit going to AA completely and I, I just found that I felt better and better um, not going and more and more myself. And then ultimately, I was having trouble sleeping. I asked my primary care to help me. She referred me to a psychiatrist and I got on the line with that person. And I knew going into that call, this was it. I'm either going to tell this person what has been going on for years or I'm not. And I'm going to suffer the rest of my life with these thoughts. I was like, it all depends on who it is and if I feel like I can do it. And there was one little thing on the huge intake I filled out and it said, you know, do you have these things? And it said, unwanted, unwanted thoughts. And I told her and it just all came pouring out. And then I got, I started to get better and I'm like better than I have ever been in my life like in my life it is just it has just been all of it the coming out part has been there's no words like Aaron mm -hmm. said I, I cannot put into words how different I am oh I'm so glad and I and I think just knowing that whole you know the list of the nevers things that you can't say and can't do and can't feel and can't, 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 you know, to, to like take that, like, it's this huge, I, I see it as a wall between the two of you and just to knock it down and throw it away. And then you get to actually talk and relate and feel and have it all be okay. And just to connect in a way, I'm sure that's just so much more significant and personal. So I'm wondering just as we finish up just about, you know, while I know that you're talking about an experience in kind of perversion of 12 step, you know, when you talk about what it feels like to leave or to be shunned, like to have people just cut off from you, you know, this is something that happens to almost everyone. A lot, well, m many of the people who listen to the podcast can relate to that experience and having kind of one foot in and one foot out. And also knowing that so many people who control other people rely on their goodness and rely on the standards they set for themselves to do the right thing. 
and that you're going to want to come back because you committed to other people to help them, you know, but to put yourself first and not have it be where you're being selfish and you're not harming anyone, you're actually saving yourself. A whole other way of looking at it, but it takes some doing. Should we go into talking about what you think needs to be put in place to help safeguard people? I mean, I can tell you what we've done. Um, this is one way, right? Just telling our story. Yeah, I'd like to also just yeah. add into that, the talking about it, the, the talking about it with other people, because I think it was also a slow process for us. You know, we came out of it and then we're out, but yet it's not like we ran to our families and said, guess what we just went through? Guess what just happened? Like it was a slow process of getting to a place to talk about it, to do some work around like, how do we talk about it? And are we comfortable talking about it? And to get out of that conditioning of mm -hmm. it's gossip or whatever. Um, just how important I feel about the talking to people and being able to share, you know, the story. And I can't, I mean, since we have got out being, how many times I've somehow there's been a crack and been able to share my experience and how it can open people up of like me too, exactly what you said, but that won't happen if we would have been too afraid. I mean, just even to the place of I'm too afraid to say this person's name out loud. I'm mm -hmm. too afraid to actually name the things that were happening. I think a big, huge piece of that process, and even it was for us in our marriage. And be open about it and not be open to, you know, get rid of some of that, the fear and the shame around, you know, we're smart people. We are two intelligent, educated people. How did we fall into that? Right. Well, what should be in place or what should people watch out for? And what's best to do if you're noticing something? Because a lot of people will talk about they noticed something, they were told to talk to someone there and nothing came of it. And so then what? What are the tools that people have at their disposal? Who can they talk to about these things? I don't know if anyone would have gotten through to me with the programming that I had at that time. I, I wish that maybe more people had tried in a more direct way, but I know people did. But some of the things are, you know, with AA specifically is trying out other meetings, not kind of jumping on the first person that says that they can help you, um, staying away from people that think they have all the answers. Um, anyone that tells you that to stop following any doctor's orders, just peace out on that person, no matter how charismatic they are. I think it's just hard when you're vulnerable to speak up when you see something wrong because you're coming in so down on yourself and your life. And so it, it makes it really challenging to uh, speak up and take breaks from AA. Oh my gosh, I know I'm probably going to get a, some sort of flack from that from people who still go, but it's important to do what we did by going to my sister's wedding and letting our brain breathe. Like that's the only way I can describe it. Because then you're allowed to make choices because you see there are options. But if you don't pull back, you can't see that there are other ways to live. And I think also you don't have a chance to find out if you can trust yourself without the group. And are you going to die? You're going to wind up in the gutter or all the things, all the things happening to you that they say, and maybe not. And for some people, they do need something that, that requires a regular check-in and someone keeping them to their commitments. And other people have left and sometimes gone back when they needed it, but haven't gone back at all or have found other things like smart recovery and other paths and gotten involved in Facebook groups where people are saying, we're not against it, but this can happen and or this happened to me and let's connect. So it's nice to know their resources. And, and so I, I'm very happy for both of you that you have been able to start anew and that you've gotten to know each other and also know yourselves. You know, I think you have this connection of going through the fire together. 
and seeing also how you can become this automaton that here you're with your newborn and out in the rain and you, you know, what, right? In retrospect, you're thinking, okay, I was, I was programmed. It's like being in a trance. Uh, okay. So I really appreciate all your time and coming forward. And I hope you don't get any flack, but if you do, you know, I hope that you kind of, yeah, I hope you kind of take it the way I take it, where people are are worried about something being taken away from them that they think they need, which is understandable, or they feel like that's a way to have the people in the group be happy with them, that they said what they needed to say, you know, and defended the group and whatever else. But a lot of people have already responded so powerfully and beautifully to the first episode. And now when people hear this, both episodes will have already come out. But people who are really relating to your experience, people who have been in 12-step and also people from other groups where the, it was the same methods of control and it was something that just went rogue and and they were on this runaway train and they didn't know, they didn't know what to watch out for. And suddenly they were going at lightning speed and they couldn't stop what was happening. All right. So be well and good luck. And if there's anything else you wanted to share or anything that you guys are working on that you want to let people know about or resources or whatever else, just share them with me so I can share them with the listeners. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Okay. Okay. Bye. One more thing before you go. I am so happy that you got to hear the third episode with Aaron and with Rachel. I am sure that we all join them in wishing them well and wishing them happiness and wishing them time to sleep in in the morning and wishing them uh, opportunities to be fully present in their lives without being distracted and without being made to feel that they're supposed to be doing something else or there's something else that's more important than what they're doing. So they are wonderful for sharing their story and uh, their son is lucky to have them as parents. And I wanted to be able to talk briefly about two things today. One is that Rachel talked about taking some time away and giving her brain a chance to breathe, as she said. And also getting to that point where she said to her sister, I don't know who I am anymore. It is incredibly important to take time away. Time away helps us at times to reset. It helps the high kind of wear off for a while. It helps clarity come back. And hopefully it helps you regain perspective. So you will remember that you're not necessarily alone in the world if when you took some time away, you reconnected with friends or family. And it also helps you be reminded about the fact that maybe there are people out in the world you can trust who really do care about you and really love you if you've been told otherwise. And also, you can check in with yourself in order to kind of see, do I miss what I was involved in? Or am I just afraid of not going back? And am I afraid of not going back because I've been told to be scared that if I don't go back, something bad will happen to me? Or mm, if I'm in a controlling or abusive relationship, do I feel like I want to go back? Or just am I scared of making this person angry with me? And that's why I feel I need to go back. Just having that time to have that perspective, to think that through and check in with your emotions is a very important thing to do. It's very hard to do when you're in it. So to find excuses to take time away, it's a wonderful thing. Even if it means you just have a few hours where you mm, either put your phone down if they're constantly trying to get in touch with you, or you just Connect with other people who you haven't connected with in a while who can remind you again about your connections in the world and also remind you about who you are. There was an article that I was interviewed for that appeared in Filter magazine online about AA. And 
I want to mention that my friend Monica Richardson, who has really been at the forefront of so much of the education about the inherent or potential problems with 12-step, was also interviewed for this article. And if you haven't already, check out her movie, The 13th Step. It's a very important movie. But I found that, as with many things, I didn't think about AA being necessarily a problem, 12-step being necessarily a problem. In fact, I didn't think about it very much at all. But a lot of people started coming to me and saying that they had gotten involved in 12-step programs and they were wanting to turn their lives around, but then they had a sponsor or a controller, an abuser or a boundary violator, and they were stuck. Because here they're told if they leave, they're going to die. But by staying... They are letting themselves potentially be open to victimization. So the problem, of course, keeps coming back to this idea that you need to be involved in things that have safeguards. And if there are no safeguards, then you don't want to be involved. Find out if there is a problem. Find out before you devote yourself to something. If there is a problem, is there somebody to talk to? Is there someone on the outside to talk to? Not just you need to bring your issues back to the group and talk about it there. There are usually not safeguards in place when it's in-house. And so what we find is that some of these groups are very cult-like, not all, but some. And one of the things that I've noticed about them is that they really give you an identity, just like a cult does. You have to call yourself an addict. You have to call yourself an alcoholic. And I think that that is problematic because you're more than those things. And if you just call yourself that or are called that, then that's going to be your focus. And then you're going to miss opportunities to focus in on the fact that it could be the issue that it's alcohol or drugs of a different sort or another kind of addiction. Or it could be that you were self-medicating because of other issues, because of other things on your mind or or other mental health issues that you really should be addressing or medical issues that you should be addressing instead of taking the time just to talk about addiction alone. The other problem that I find with a lot of these groups is this whole idea of sharing. So you can decide in some of them to not share, but usually the push is to share, to really be pushed to open up to people who sometimes are going to respond to your information in a healthy way and sometimes are not. And there are some people who found themselves sharing much more than they would have otherwise with people they really barely knew because they couldn't defend against the social pressures of the moment, the kind of peer pressure, I suppose. And they thought it was a way for people to be happy with them. And then they wound up being very unhappy that they felt kind of strong-armed into something or felt that they couldn't say no. And there are people who will go along with things because they don't want people to be unhappy with them. And they'll make commitments to groups because they are told that that's the way to show that they have integrity. And they'll be then more focused on proving that they can make the commitment rather than really researching the group that they're making a commitment to. And sometimes what can also help, oh, one more second, I'm going to redo that. And sometimes, and it's really good to know this, is that you can get into some very deep and dark stories, some trauma, a lot of history, things that are going on for you in your life now. And that even though there could be a room filled with people who are caring, sometimes it's not always that safe, as we've noticed with Rachel and with Aaron, but even if the people do care, they're still not mental health professionals. And a lot of them are still healing themselves. So they're going to approach your issues through the lens of their issues some of the time. And that's a really important thing to keep perspective on. And I know that People don't want to disappoint other people. And they want to say what they know they think they're supposed to say in the moment. But to take the time away, going back to Rachel and Aaron's point, to take that time away and think, 
how was my experience in that group with that group of people? Did I receive what I was there for? Or am I left feeling worse about myself? Or am I left feeling I really can't trust myself now? Am I left feeling like my life was really awful or it will be awful if I leave? Those are the red flags. Those are the things you want to watch out for to make sure that in all of your time commitment to making your life better, that there isn't something concurrently making it worse. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to be in touch with me. And also feel free to go on to different Facebook pages and other websites to find out about other people's experiences in 12-step and in AA and learn about other routes towards helping you with your addiction. AA becomes sort of the fallback and it's easy to remember. It has an easy moniker. And so I think that's why it becomes the go-to. But there are things that are much more updated and science-based and are going to probably get you a lot farther without damaging you along the way. And again, as before, if you're having a perfectly fine experience, great. And keep at it if it's working for you. But if it's not working for you, don't feel stuck. There are other options. Take good care. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.